Hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here and thank you for coming. So um, let's start. Your favorite guys, right? <laughs> so um, I was uh, catching up with my childhood memories and I came across this scene from the Lion King movie. Now, at some point, the three good friends, Timon, Pumba, and Simba, lay down on the grass and they're gazing at the stars. Wherever there's Timon, there's Pumba. And when we have these two guys together, there's gonna be some fight. Now, Timon, looking at the stars, insists that they are fireflies, which is quite an interesting uh, theory about it. But Pumba seems a little bit more um, educated, apparently, and he believes that time was for the gas. So, who do we think is wrong and who is right? Before we answer that, let's take a moment and think how do we see stars, right? I mean, we see them daily. First, in the day, we see our sun. Big, yellow, very, very bright. It makes our day, and plus, it gives us a time during summer. In a cool and nice summer night, we see thousands of those stars in the sky. For example, the net. If you don't know him, trust me, he's out there. <laughs> now, we see them, and they're, they're small, they're far away, right? I mean, sometimes they flicker a little bit, right? And if you pay close attention, you can actually distinguish some colors. The thing is that when we look at the stars, we don't know how they end up there. How, what are they made of? Or will it be there forever? Right? We don't know that, we cannot tell. To our eyes, the stars look exactly the same every day and every night. And I tell you now that this is not the case. Stars do change. And together, through this talk, we're going to explore the lives of stars. If we were to put the life of a star on a diagram, it would look something like that. So we have all these magnificent, amazing things, like, uh, oops, sorry about that, uh, like red giants, and planetary nebulae, and supernovae, black holes, neutron stars. I mean, these are fascinating things. And together we're going to learn what are these, and why they're so important for a star. Before we go on, I want you to know something. Stars are, let's say, divided into two classes. We have small stars, or low mass stars, and high mass stars, or large stars. Now, low mass stars live for up to billions of years. They're smaller, they're dimmer, and they like to conclude their lives in more subtle ways, let's say. On the other hand, we have the large stars. These are massive. They tend to live shorter, for a shorter time, millions of years, very short. Um, but they're brighter, as, uh, they're bigger, and they end their lives in glorious explosions. And believe me, they want everybody to know about them. So, let's start. Let's answer two questions. First, what is a star? And two, where is a star born? Now, stars are big balls of burning hydrogen. Pumba, right. Um, they are born in these gigantic clouds, hydrogen clouds, in outer space. Now, in these clouds, gravity, which is an attractive force, piles up hydrogen atoms together to form a larger mass and produce what we call a protostar. Now, protostars, are nothing more than big balls of hydrogen in high temperatures, which is caused by this process. Now, be careful here, because a protostar is not yet a star. Think of it like that. A protostar is like, as Simba is still in the mother of his belly. So, this is like an embryo star. Something is missing here for the actual star to be born. Let's see what this is. The protostar gains more and more mass and is squeezing hydrogen atoms in its core. The temperature rises extremely, goes up to millions of degrees. And suddenly, the hydrogen atoms are so close together that they can actually merge. They combine to form helium and produce energy. This is exactly what we were missing. Now a star is born. When we have two 
hundreds of atoms, and they merge, and they produce helium and energy. This is a process that we call fusion. <clears throat> and this is why stars live, they burn, and this is why also we see flickering spots on the sky. Seems like a simple process, right? Well, I guarantee you, the birth of a star can take up to hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, if you think about it, this is about 100 times more than the age of the Egyptian pyramids. So a person, even if they want to, they won't be able to witness something uh, so magnificent. Now we know that uh, our star is born, we can imagine it as the birth of any animal species, or in this case, the birth of Simba. The movie goes on and on, and uh, there comes a point where Simba has to face the forms of Scar and the hyenas into occasional battles. In a very similar way, the life of a star is a battle, but not with hyenas. It's a battle between gravitational forces and thermal forces. So what, what, what does this mean? What are these forces? We're going to see now. On the one hand, we have gravitational forces. These forces drive fusion. They put more and more hydrogen into the core, and that's shrinking the star. But on the other hand, when helium is produced and formed, energy is produced and wants to be released away from the star. So the star is expanding. Thermal forces expand the star. Okay? And this also because, and because we have the release of energy, the temperature of the star is going down a little bit. Now, when these two forces are in balance with each other throughout the, the whole star, our star is in what we say equilibrium, or the animal kingdom is now at peace. This process goes on and on for millions or even billions of years. But unfortunately, there comes a time where actually hydrogen reserves in the core do run low. Right, we cannot have infinite fuel. The hydrogen now forms a shell around <coughs> what is now a helium core. Now, in the shell, hydrogen can still fuse, produce energy, and so the star is expanding because the thermal force is winning, right? But at the inner part of the star, the helium atoms do really slightly to combine to, to produce energy for the star to go on. So gravity forces win and they squeeze and squeeze the core. The star now becomes so, so big through this continuous fusion of hydrogen in the shell that becomes what we call a red giant. Now these are amazing stars. These stars are like... They're, they're, they're amazing. So let's see what <laughs> I can prove it, I can prove it. Um, we, 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 say, we use the term giant because this, the, the continuous fusion of star expands. We use the word red because the star is releasing energy and so it lowers its temperature and pulls down. Now, this is why they are amazing. They can become so big as the inner part of our solar system. If this were to be our sun, and it will be some point, but not, not very soon, don't worry, it's about five uh, billion years for that to happen, so don't worry. Um, the sun will swallow any planet in its path. It might even swallow Earth. Now, let's go in the center of the star, because something is staring there. As we said, gravity is winning in the core, and so it squeezes helium atoms so hard together that they actually combine, and they can now produce energy and form carbon atoms, and the star continues to live. So, think that. The ashes of hydrogen burning have actually become the fuel for a new period of the star, and so the star continues to live. But this won't last forever. There comes a point where the, where the star will not be able to produce any more energy. Now this depends entirely on the mass of the star, right? Let's first see what will happen to a low mass star. Now, low mass stars cannot produce any more energy at this point, and gravitational forces win in the core, 
the, the gravity shrinks and shrinks the core so much that the core becomes unstable at some point. And suddenly, the thermal forces in the core produce a, a soft wave that goes throughout the star. Now, the soft wave drives all the layers of the star into outer space. Now, this phenomenon produces a magnificent and colorful uh, cloud, which we call the planetary nebula, as we see here. Now, let's go in the center of the nebula, because something, something is still there. The core of the star has actually survived the layer spinning, and it's what we call the white dwarf. Now, these stars are small, like they are the size of the Earth, and they shine them. And here's a fun fact about these guys. Um, we have carbon. We have high temperatures and high pressures. After many years, temperature will go down. What we have? We make a diamond. The, the whole star will crystallize. So at some point, after many, 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 many years, our sun will become a diamond in the size of the Earth in space. Now, this concludes the life of a small star. Let's see what happens now in a large star. Large stars have produced more energy because they have more mass and gravity is stronger. Gravity drives fusion and more and more elements are formed and energy is produced. I mean, look how many elements we have here. So, we can think of the star now as a, an element factory. This fusion goes on until the core is made entirely out of iron. At this point, the star cannot produce any more energy, no matter how big it is. No more energy is produced. And so it comes to its death. Gravitational forces win the core, but they're so strong this time. They squeeze the core with enormous pressures. The core becomes unstable again, but now produces a much, much more violent shock wave throughout the star. And this shock wave explodes the whole star into outer space, into what we call a supernova. Now, supernovas are these. They're, they're, they're so violent and so, so bright as billions of stars put together. Think of that. There is a good chance that if there is a star in the sky, which you cannot see with your bare eyes, after it explodes into a supernova, you will be able to see. There's a good chance. It's not guaranteed, but there's a good chance. Let's go down to the center of the supernova because, again, something is happening there. The core of the star does not survive the explosion per se. I mean, I said it's very violent. Something else happens. The core goes something more like a transformation. It can turn into what we call a neutron star. And these guys are stars made entirely out of neutrons. They're very, very small. They have the sizes of cities, like extremely small. So we go from something which is like half of the solar system, something which is like the size of a city. And uh, yeah, they, they look not scary, but they dare to go. Go close, take a teaspoon and scale it. You will find out that a teaspoon of those stars weighs more than Mount Everest. So good luck. Now, if our star is even larger, it will, the core will transform into something more dark. A black hole. Now, black holes are these mysterious and exotic objects whose gravitational pull is so, so strong that they can trap anything in their proximity, even light. So please don't go near that. It's a no zone. We see now that the key characteristic of a star is its mass. I mean, whatever the star turns into, neutron star, black hole, white dwarf, it depends entirely on its mass. And this is amazing because if we know the mass of the star at the very beginning of its life, we can predict its whole life. And that concludes my presentation, and I just want to finish with this amazing uh, demonstration of a supernova and the final moments of a large star. And say one more time that stars do have lives. 
They are born, they live, and they die. And what is most amazing is that this is a cycle. So after the death of the star, through the ashes of the star, more and more stars, more and more stars will, live, will, will, will be born again and again. Thank you very much. So, actually, I don't know if we have a fancy microphone. Yeah, then we, okay, and it works? Cool. So, then, uh, yeah, there is a question here to the left. Yes. Yeah, so you can just throw the stick. Right. Yes, so I was wondering how do you measure the mass of the, of the star? What do you do? Okay, I don't know the question. Um, so, how do you measure the mass of the star? Okay. Um, so, I, there, there are two main ways. One way is, um, usually stars um, uh, go in pairs, or trios, or whatever, so they like to have company. So if you observe these two or three stars in the orbit system, it's easy to use some basic uh, gravitational laws to find the mass. Another way is very, very interesting. You can, you can get the, the mass of the star by only knowing its temperature and how much light you get from the star. And yeah, so you, you can do that. So it's, much, it's always easier to observe stars in big, in big groups because then you, you have uh, more stars to work with and then you can form a relationship with that. Okay, thank you. One more question over there. Okay. So uh, what if you determines that a supernova will turn into uh, a different star or a black hole? So what determines uh, how the supernova will behave? It will go to another star or will die? Okay. So um, <clears throat> so the supernova, as I said, is the the, the end of a, of a high mass star. So now um, whether the, the star will turn will, will um, the core of the star will turn into a neutron star or a black hole depends entirely on its mass. So the more massive the star is, it will turn into a black hole. If it's a little bit less massive, it will turn into a neutron star. And if it's even less massive, it will turn into a white hole. So the mass here is the, the key. Right, thank you. And any more questions? Here's one. Why is iron the heaviest element that can be produced in the, the core of the star or wood? Ah, okay, nice question. So, um, because um, iron is the, the, the element with the highest binding energy, so then uh, you would need extra energy, input energy for it to, to form to, to form into other elements. Right? Um, so, if you don't have extra energy, you cannot uh, produce any energy. So, uh, for that reason, this will be the final. Um, um, Element of the star. Okay, and do we have time for one more final question? Uh, what is considered uh, of the beginning of the star life? So the question was, what is considered as the beginning of the life of the star? Um, it's uh, it's the protostar. Um, but when fusion starts, like fusion is the key here. When fusion starts, the the, the star is actually born. So that's why I said that a protostar is like an embryo star. It's still trying to form within the cloud. So the moment fusion hits in the core, then the star is born. So it's basically gas coming together forms this ball of hydrogen and the rest. Alright, thank you very much, George.